asked me a cool question the other day um, that got me thinking about what the average protein charge is. And it turns out it depends on where a protein is located within a cell as well as what type of organism the cell is from. And so I found some cool links and some cool resources and stuff. Um, I want to take you through some of these stats as well as the reasons behind having different charges. We'll get more into detail about this, um, but there are a couple of things that make it more um, favorable or unfavorable to, for a protein to have a particular charge. Um, so proteins don't want to be too charged because then they're going to be either sticking to things really, really strongly because opposite charge attracts, or they're going to be repelling from things really, really strongly because like charges repel. Um, and but they're also not going to want to be neutral because then they can't really interact with things, especially like they can't interact with water well. And if there's water all around it. Um, and if the water doesn't want to hang out with it because the water has partial positive and partial negative, and if your protein is all neutral, then the water is not going to want to hang out with it. And your proteins are going to have to like get clumped together and aggregated and all this stuff. And it's not soluble and it's this whole issue. So proteins tend to try to avoid the extremes, but also try to avoid the middle. Um, and it turns out that um, what charge they have is going to depend on the environment that they're in, um, because if the environment that they're in is more acidic, it has more positive, free positive charges around that it can latch onto and make the protein positive, um, then that's one thing and then it'll want to be one way and then if it's in an environment that's more basic or more alkaline where there's fewer of those um, positive charged protons around um, to latch onto then it's going to be more negatively charged um, and so it's got to bump up its game um, and then so you end up with proteins having different PIs which is the pH at which they are neutral overall. Um, so different proteins are going to have different pHs um, or different PIs and their different charges, and this is going to depend a lot on what compartment they're in and what mem whether they're membrane bound or not membrane bound. Um, so membranes we typically we often think of them as these like lipidy things, but they're actually have these negative charges, and so proteins that are in membranes tend to have a higher um, tend to have a higher PI, then to be more basic, more positively charged. So let's get back and we'll get way more into detail over this. This is just like an overview. Um, and so cytoplasm proteins tend to have a lower PI. If you're in or in the lysosome, where they're like a high, where, where there's a really low pH, because that's where they like break up proteins and stuff. Um, whereas if you're in the nucleus, the mitochondria, um, or in like a membrane, charged membrane, you tend to have a higher um, PI and therefore you tend to be more positively charged. Um, and so we're going, we'll get way more into this. Um, and so let's, now let's get back to the idea of the PI, the isoelectric point, the point at which a protein is neutral overall. Overall, it's going to be neutral. There's going to be parts of it that are positively charged and parts of it that are negatively charged. And this comes because the charges are coming from individual amino acids, so individual protein letters. And proteins are long chains of these letters folded up. Different proteins have different numbers, and the ones that can be positively charged, the ones, these ones we call basic, as well as the ones that can be negatively charged, the one we call acidic. Um, and whether or not they're charged is going to depend on pH. Um, the lower the pH, the more acidic the solution, the more free protons there are available. Um, and so these are the positively charged parts that can then latch on and make the, neutral, the negative ones neutral and make the neutral ones positive. Um, so the lower you are in the pH, the more protons are available. I know it's kind of confusing, but it's because it's an inverse log. And so the lower the pH, the more charged a protein is going, positively charged a protein is going to be the higher the pH, the fewer protons are available. If there's less protons available, they're not going to be able to take the protons, and so they're going to be either neutral or they're going to be negatively charged. And so at a higher pH, more basic conditions, you're going more alkaline, um, sometimes you call this, you're going to be more um, negatively charged. So the protein different proteins have different points at which like they'll tip the scale where the balance of the positive parts and the balance of the negative parts, um, where the whole overall balance is neutral. This point we call the isoelectric point or the PI. And so the PI is the pH at which the protein is um, going to be neutral overall. And so if the protein is below the PI, you're going to um, be on net, going to have a positive um, charge. And if you're above the PI, the pH is above the PI of the protein, you're going to be overall negatively charged. And so different proteins have different PIs. And therefore, at the same pH, they're going to have different charges. 
So, and it turns out that there's this cool distribution of what charges proteins typically have, and it depends on where they're located in a cell, among other things. And so I found this really cool paper that'll take um, you through some of the figures in a minute. Um, but you can see that the distribution, so this is showing the PI of the proteins in various compartments. And you can see that the distributions are very different depending on the different departments. So, for example, in the cytoplasm, the general interior of the cell, you're going to have a slightly acidic condition, um, PI, so a PI of like 6.87. So, if in the cytoplasm you're about 7 inch, um, you're going to have a net negative charge. And if you're running a gel, say a native page gel, um, I'll get to this in a, later, um, but keep this in mind if you know what I'm talking about. If not, we'll get to it later. But basically, you're going to have a net negative charge, which you need. Um, in order to, because they're going to be above the pH uh, of the, the PI of the protein, so you're going to have that net negative charge. So you don't need to do anything to get the protein to run through. But if you look at something that's more like membrane bound, or if you look at something that is, say, like in the nucleus where you have the membrane as well as you have um, just like a higher pH overall, um, because you have all that positively charged um, or negatively charged DNA, you want to have. But if you're saying like in the nucleus, not only do you have membrane um, to deal with, but you also have um, the DNA or DNA. And so all that stuff is gonna be negatively charged. So proteins tend to want to have a more positive charge in order to kind of bind to the DNA or to not repel from the membrane if they're a membrane bound protein. So even though we think about proteins, we think about these membranes as being all lipidy, all fatty. They actually have these phospholipid heads, these negatively charged heads. And one of the core concepts in biochemistry is that opposite charges are going to attract and like charges are going to repel. So one of the key features governing whether a protein would like want to be positively charged or negatively charged is going to be um, what's the charge like of the things around it? And so if the things around it are going to be all negatively charged, you want to be positively charged so you don't just like repel from them. But you wouldn't want to be too positively charged because then you just get like permanently stuck to them. And then you'd be repelling from other positively charged things and it wouldn't be good. So proteins tend to want to be around like slightly charged state. Um, so they're kind of around their PI often, um, but not like at the PI. Typically. So they'll typically be like somewhere above or somewhere below, um, but not like right at the PI. Um, and so you get this distribution of where PIs are located because the pH is going to vary in these various compartments, as well as because proteins tend to avoid being actually like at the, avoid having their like pH at the pH of that compartment. Um, and so basically a protein is going to be typically, um, it's not this quite as simplistic, but a protein is often most um, unhappy and least soluble at its isoelectric point. So when the pH is at the isoelectric point, when it's neutral overall, this is to, often because like the things around it are not neutral. Um, and so if the things around it are not neutral and it is neutral, well, it's gonna be really unattractive to those other things. And so say water, water is highly polar. It's got these partial positive parts and these partial negative parts. Um, and so it's going to the positive parts, so those are the protons parts, they're gonna like get attracted to the negative parts, the, the oxygen, so these are just partial charges, but they're still really important. So the water is gonna link up into these networks. And if your thing is neutral, it's not going to be allowed into water's network. And if it's not allowed into water's network, then it seems to clump up and aggregate. So you have these kind of two forces at play where you don't want to be too, you don't want to be neutral, but you don't want to be too charged. Um, and so proteins tend to have PIs that kind of like optimize this balance. Um, and so because the pH is going to vary in different compartments and because the charge on the membrane is going to vary in different compartments, then you're going to have different PIs of proteins in these different compartments. Um, and it's not quite this simple. Um, so you see that even within compartments, you see this broad distribution where you still have like different distributions. And some of this is playing into the point that some of it is in the membrane and some of it is in the, just the liquidy part, um, as well as sometimes maybe the protein is hanging out with DNA. So it wants to be um, more positively charged, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, 
the proteins have evolution has like fine tuned it and optimized it so that you tend to have these distributions where in say the cytoplasm, so in the general interior of the cell and the cytoskeleton and in the lysosomes, if the lysosome is one of these compartments within the cells, um, this compartment is really acidic. Um, and so the compartment has high protons. Um, and so if the compartment has this high proton environment, then you're going to tend to have a lower pH of your protein itself um, to kind of adapt to that so that it's not too far away from its PI. Um, and so if it wasn't like you wouldn't want it, the PI to be way, way below because then your protein would be super, 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 super charged. Um, and so this makes sense that you would have a more like acidic protein. And remember that this is all just like in comparison to what we typically think of as like neutral. And so an acidic protein is going to have more of those amino acids that can be positively charged. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to always be positively charged. It's going to depend on the pH. Um, and so the PI is the pH at which the protein is going to be neutral overall. And if you go below that, you're going to be positively charged um, on net. But if your PI, if the pH is lower in the compartment you're in, then you're going to have to go even more to get positively charged or to get the same amount of positively chargedness. Um, and so this makes sense that you would have then a more like acidic protein in terms of having a low PI. Okay, so what about the other end of things, the basic proteins, the ones that have a lot of those um, negative, those positively charged residues? those positively charged um, amino acids. So when amino acids link together, then we call them residues because they no longer have that amino part and that carboxylic acid part, um, so we call them residues. It's just a technical thing. So I sometimes use residues, I sometimes use amino acids, and we tend to use them interchangeably, even though they're technically residues once they're linked up into proteins. Okay, but anyway, so in the nucleus and the mitochondria, those compartments have a higher pH. And so now your proteins typically have a higher pI. Um, the proteins also, off, the membranes often have a high membrane charge, so they have a lot of those uh, like charged phospholipids in their membranes, and so the proteins are going to have to compensate by having more positive, more positive charge, so they would have thus a higher PI. The pH is going to be below their PI, um, and this means that they're going to be more protons available, so they're not going to be positively charged, and then they can hang out with that more negatively charged membrane. Um, and then you also have more neutral, um, where you have moderate pH brain charge and things like the plasma membrane and the extracellular environment and the plasmic reticulum. And again, this is just like on average, and you get these broader distributions and these subcellular compartments of mentalization and things. Um, this is really cool resource I found too. It's like Proteome PI um, 2.0, Proteome's isoelectric point database. So this database is really cool. So you can search for different species. So this is like human. Um, and it'll show you things about the distribution of the PIs of the protein. So it's like thousands and thousands of proteins and their predicted PIs. And for these are just like predicted. Um, so it's based on like the individual amino acids and what combinations the protein have. But when the proteins are actually, when those amino acids are linked up, then that kind of changes the properties of the amino acids. And so these soft, different various softwares take this into account in different ways. Um, so there are different softwares that will give you slightly different values for these estimations. Um, and so basically this database has a whole bunch of different species and you can see all this information about them. Um, and it's pretty interesting. Um, and so this is like this isoelectric point and molecular weight. Um, you can see that there's a bunch of different software that'll predict different things, but you get this basic distribution where you have different, um, different ideals depending on different compartments um, and various things like that. You can see things like the proteins with the lowest isoelectric point, um, the highest isoelectric point. See, look, there's a lot of acidic residues here when you have a low PI and a lot of basic residues um, when you have a high PI. Um, and you can also get general statistics, pretty cool stuff. Um, and you can do this for different species. So here's the fruit fly. So you can see that it has a different distribution than um, the human. And, and if you were to go and look at like a bacteria or a virus or something, you'd see even bigger differences. Um, and so speaking of, you can, um, here's general statistics for all the analyzed proteomes. 
Um, so you can see that in a eukarya, um, you're going to have around like 50 is going to be your mean like size, 50 kilodaltons. Um, bacteria is around like 35, um, it's kind of interesting. Um, also, yeah, they have a bunch of different stuff. Um, but you can see they have different distributions of the PIs. Uh, you can see that um, there are very there's different methods and different um, things and all sorts of all sorts of cool stuff to explore. Basically, is what I want to say is just that go explore this website. It's really cool. So this whole topic came up because someone was asking me about this um, blue native technique um, that I've done a post on in the past, um, and so. It, it, the native page is a form of SDS page. Um, so, or not SDS page, sorry, it's a form of page. Um, so polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. The type of page that we do most typically when we're working with proteins is going to be SDS page. SDS is sodium dodecyl sulfate. It is a detergent. Um, it's an anionic detergent, so it's negatively charged detergent, which is like an artificial soap. So what the SDS does is it unfolds and denatures the protein with the help of some heat um, that helps to with the denaturation. The SDS then kind of like coats the protein, coats this unfolded protein. This gives it a negative charge and it keeps it unfolded and soluble. What's important about that negative charge is a couple of things. And one of them is that it's going to allow you to use a positive charge and at the end of your gel to allow the proteins to then sneak through this gel and get separated by size because the longer proteins are gonna get tangled up more and then they're gonna travel slower. And so when you turn off the electricity, they're gonna be higher up. So because different proteins are gonna have different charges, um, the SDS is going to neutralize it and give them an even playing field. So the charge of the protein itself shouldn't matter. So this is important for like helping level the playing field. And it's also important because some proteins are going to be positively charged and thus they would get um, could go the wrong way through your gel or if you didn't have the SDS um, or they wouldn't move at all. So this isn't a problem for SDS page, but what if you don't add the SDS? Well, why wouldn't you want to add the SDS? You can figure out cool things about proteins, um, like more about their shape and about who they're hanging out with if you use a native page. So native page, you don't add SDS. This keeps protein complexes together. So you can see if proteins are interacting. You can also detect differences based on like how proteins are folded and things like that if you run a native page. So now you might be thinking, okay, well, what about those positively charged proteins? But if you have a positively charged protein, then how do you run a native page? So there's this alternative technique that I talked about before, and it's just called blue native page. And you actually, it's blue. Um, it's Comassi blue stain. So you might be used to Comassi from like staining gels, but Comassi stain um, also has a negatively charged, and we use it to stain proteins in our gels because it binds to proteins. And so if we run a blue native page, we run Comassi with our protein, it's going to provide a negative charge. Um, so that even if we have a positively charged protein, it'll still run through the gel. But it can also interfere with complexes potentially and you have more <laughs> mess. Um, so someone was asking me like, well, why would you, why do you need a normal native page um, if you have blue native page? Um, and so and then you don't have to worry about if your protein's charged. So I think that's the main reason is that there could be that's a really great question, first of all. Um, and you got me to find those other um, links, those databases, um, and those articles. So I hope that it helps that person to ask. And thank you for asking. It was a really great question. Um, and um, yeah, so I think that the reason is mainly that it would cause, it could potentially cause um, problems with the interactions, as well as that it's messy. Um, and then your gel gets blue, and yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's not, it's messy. <laughs> Um, so if you don't need it, then you can just run a normal native page. And it turns out that you could often get away with just running this normal native page because if you're running just like proteins that are like cytosolic proteins, these tend to have a lower PI on average. Um, and so if you're running a gel at a, like, especially if you're running at a higher pH, um, then your protein is going um, to to be negatively charged. Um, and therefore you can run it without needing to add the, um, add the capacity.
But if you're dealing with like nuclear proteins, if you're dealing with um, membrane proteins, then this blue native can come into play. And so you see it used a lot more with those type of proteins because it provides that negative charge um, that's needed to um, get the proteins to move through the gel.